Testing, testing. You guys hear it? Yeah? Uh, Jen, can I start? They can if they want. We like, we like to. They enjoy, a, a they enjoy the game. Yeah. Okay, so we're going to start. You're right. Everyone ready? Good. Good afternoon. Happy Tuesday. On today's stated agenda, the council will vote on the following land use items an application to rezone the former Parkway Hospital in Council Member Karen Koswitz's district. The rezoning will facilitate 135 uh, apartments, and this is going to be part of MIH option one. Next is approval of 809 Atlantic Avenue in Majority Leader Lori Cumbo's district, a rezoning and special permits for 286 units of housing and the restoration of an adjacent landmark. 103 North 13th Street in Council Member Steve Levin's district is gonna be a new seven-story mixed-use building with retail office and light industrial space. 245 East 53rd Street in Council Member Powers' district is going to add a commercial overlay and allow a new six-story building with commercial uses on the ground floor. And finally, the designation of Park Terrace West, West 217th Street Historic District in Council Member Idanas Rodriguez's district in Inwood. The council will vote on a resolution that amends the rules of the Land Use Committee to clarify and reorganize language that has remained largely unchanged since the Land Use Committee was established in 1990 and to make certain substantive changes to improve the committee's functioning. In addition, as I said before, the council is making changes to a lot of committees today. We're gonna to create new committees, we're gonna eliminate a committee, there's gonna be a lot of changes on committees, and we'll vote uh, on the floor today to finalize those. They were voted in the Rules Committee this morning. Moving on, the council is gonna vote on the following pieces of legislation. The council will vote on a few bills concerning water tank inspections and safety. New York City has some of the best, if not the best, drinking water in the country, and that is no, no small part to the strong measures we've taken in the past to regulate the eight to 10,000 water tank structures in our city. While our existing laws are strong, the council's committed to ensuring that there are no loopholes or any opportunities to tamper with inspection results when it comes to our drinking water. The bills we're voting on today will further ensure compliance, allowing New Yorkers to continue to feel confident that their water is always safe, clean, and protected. The first bill is introduction 1053A, which I sponsored. It would require building owners to ensure that water tank inspection companies submit annual inspection reports directly to the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene. That's currently not the case. Introduction 1056B, sponsored by Councilmember Costa Constantinides, would require the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene to conduct periodic audits of buildings' annual water tank inspection documentation and require DOHMH, MA, DOHMH to conduct 125 inspections of water tanks selected at random to help ensure the accuracy of annual inspection reports it receives and require the department to post the results of such periodic audits and inspections online. Councilmember Constantinides is at a rally outside, so when he joins us, happy to have him speak on this. Uh, next is introduction 1138A, sponsored by Councilmember Alik Ampre Samuel. It will require the Health Department to conduct additional reviews of documentation of water tank inspections without providing prior notice to building owners where harmful bacteria are found or where certain violations have been identified by the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene. This bill also requires that the department post the results of these reviews online. <clears throat> Uh, Councilmember Amprey Samuels is not able to be here today. Uh, next, introduction uh, 1150A, sponsored by Councilmember Ben Kalos, will require the Department of Health, Health and Mental Hygiene uh, that water tank inspection results be submitted electronically to the department. And when the Councilmember arrives, I'm happy to have him speak. 
And our next bill, sponsored by our health committee chair, Mark Levine, would require that water tank inspectors be either licensed master plumbers, work under the direct and continuing supervision of such a licensed master plumber, or be a registered design professional. This bill would also require that the cleaning, painting, and coating of water tanks be conducted by an individual qualified con to conduct water tank inspections or by a person who holds a commercial pesticide applicator certification. And uh, the chair, I wanna ask him to come up, but he's done a great job shepherding these bills and having a great hearing on these bills. So come on up, Mark. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. This is really a sweeping package to help ensure New Yorkers can have confidence in the water coming out of their taps. It is the safest tap water in the world, and we have a public health interest and an environmental interest that people not be grossed out by what they fear is in their water tanks. And the way we can ensure people about the quality of the water coming out of their taps is to have inspections, oversight, transparency in the process for maintaining and monitoring uh, this critical infrastructure. And amongst this important package is the bill that I'm pleased to be lead sponsor of, which um, defines the qualifications for people who are doing the inspection and maintenance work. Uh, as, as the speaker laid out, um, uh, the qualifications for licensing are under the supervision of people who are adequately licensed. Um, so that New Yorkers have the confidence that the work is being done right by qualified professionals. Um, I'm pleased that this package has moved uh, together uh, to really send a strong message to New Yorkers that their drinking water is safe and will continue to be safe. Thank you, Mr. Thank Speaker. You. Uh, of the last uh, two bills in this package, Introduction 1167A, sponsored by Councilman Rafael Salamanca, will require building owners to repair uh, damage to water tanks or their supporting structures and would impose a civil penalty if they fail to do so. Councilman Salamanca is not able to be with us today. And lastly, Introduction 1169A, sponsored by Councilman Richie Torres, will require visual evidence of water tanks such as photographs or videos to be submitted with inspection results to DOHMH, and Councilmember Torres is not able to be with us. I want to quickly uh, call up Councilmember uh, Constantinides to talk about his bill on the audits of water tank inspections before we move on to the next package. Thank you, Speaker Johnson, for addressing this public health crisis. I also want to thank my colleagues, uh, Richie Torres, Mark Levine, uh, and uh, Bur Bronx Borough President Ruben Diaz Jr. for their partnership on this legislation. I also want to acknowledge Frank Runyon, who spent the last few years bringing this issue to light. Uh, if not for his reporting, thousands of lives would be at risk, and we are grateful to him. Uh, you know, New York, you know, clean water is a fundamental right, yet those who live in one of the 10,000 buildings with a water prank to tank are put in jeopardy. Uh, too, uh, too often, just one of three tanks uh, cleaning companies will scoop out dead rodents, scrape away sediments, bleach down the cedar walls. That same person can then conduct the necessary annual inspection of a clean tank and declare it sanitary. And then nothing else has to happen for a year. And if the owner files the required inspection documents with the city, they also paint an inaccurate picture of what comes out of those ad average faucets. Sadly, less than half of the landlords filed paperwork between 2015 and 2017, as we saw reported in the news. Uh, this is not how we should function. Uh, so this bill would require the Department of Health to audit inspection documents filed with the city. Just as important, they would conduct 125 surprise inspections of water tanks every single year to give that clear picture of what is actually happening from one inspection to another. Uh, so it is, you know, I definitely appreciate the speaker and uh, your strong leadership on this and making sure that we can protect New Yorkers and their health. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Costa. Thank you. Uh, next, we're going to vote on a series of bills aimed at protecting individuals on probation or incarcerated individuals. These next bills will provide protections for individuals who are on probation. Uh, and other folks that are incarcerated. We are at a time we're trying to remove a lot of barriers to individuals who <clears throat> were incarcerated or are currently on probation 
who are facing a difficult time reintegrating back into society. So these bills are a very important step in that direction. Introduction 1427, sponsored by Councilmember Donovan Richards, the chair of our Public Safety Committee, would prohibit the Department of Probation, probation from requiring marijuana testing unless abstinence from marijuana has been determined to be necessary to lead an otherwise law-abiding life. <clears throat> Nobody should be going to jail for marijuana, and that includes people on probation. My understanding is that the department's policy is not to violate people on probation solely for a positive marijuana test, but we are on the verge, I believe, of legalizing marijuana in New York State, hopefully. We shouldn't be testing people for it uh, within very limited exceptions. For those probationers who are staying uh, on the course that's been set for them and satisfying all of their conditions of probation, we shouldn't be looking for minor things that could send them back to jail because we should be looking for ways to keep people out of jail. As if it's, uh, if, and if it's truly necessary to be absent from marijuana in order uh, to abide by what a judge has set, the department or a judge can still make that decision uh, for a person to be tested if it's necessary. This is a common sense bill, and it takes a step closer to ending the criminalization of marijuana. I want to invite up Councilmember Donovan Richards to speak on his bill. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and what better way to spend my birthday than being in this council voting out justice bills. See, I am privileged to be here at 36 years old, but a lot of the 36-year-olds I grew up with have been locked out of mainstream America and living in a permanent undercast system. Therefore, the criminal justice system has become a revolving door for them because they cannot get a job, housing or access to higher education, all because of trap doors like the one we are closing today. As the Daily News reported yesterday, nearly 300 individuals ended up behind bars again, all because they lit up a spliff in 2018. The ban on marijuana testing while on probation will ensure thousands of young black and brown men and women who are trying to get their lives together will not end up behind bars because they smoke cannabis. We all know that there is no public safety value in violating people over low level marijuana offenses, especially today when the state has already legalized medical marijuana and is talking about legalized recreational use. The mere fact that we are still summoning and arresting New Yorkers in the supposed progressive capital of the world is regressive and hypocritical at best. Five former probation commissioners and former chief judge of New York State, Jonathan Lipman, all agreed this policy should be changed. With that being said, we rest our case. I want to thank Speaker Johnson, especially for his leadership and partnership in really moving uh, in creating justice for communities across not only the city, but I think this is going to reverberate around the state and, and, af uh, and across the country, actually, because there is a national mm -hmm. conversation happening around this as well. Uh, one of the most famous people talking about this right now is Meek Mill, mm -hmm. who was violated over popping a willy as well. Uh, I want to thank Daniel Addis as well, Casey Addison, and Laura Pope, and Jeff Baker for helping us all achieve justice for thousands of New Yorkers. Too bad we didn't get this done 30 years ago, 20 years ago. There are thousands of people who are locked out of mainstream society all because they were violated over marijuana. Thank you, Thank you Thank Mr. You. Speaker. Happy birthday. Thank you. Happy birthday, Donovan. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, next is introduction 944A, sponsored by Councilman Rory Lansman, the chair of our Committee on Justice, uh, which would ensure that the Department of Corrections is promptly notifying incarcerated individuals and their attorneys when they are detained solely due to bail set and the amount of less than t ten amount less than ten dollars to allow them to post it and get released. This is a big deal. It really uh, dovetails on the state legislation that just passed, and I want to invite Councilmember Lanceman up to speak on this. Thank you. Um, it seems crazy to think that a dollar could be all that is standing between someone and their freedom, but we know that on too many occasions, defendants spend hours or even days in jail on bail of less than $10. Single-digit bail, including bail of just a dollar, can be set on a case to allow a defendant to receive credit for the time they spend incarcerated on a previous open case or because of a hold from another jurisdiction. 
It is merely an accounting mechanism to, to allow the court to keep track of a defendant's time incarcerated. But once the earlier case is resolved, a defendant, his or her family, and even his or her lawyer may be unaware that a dollar is all that is preventing them from going home. My bill, intro 944, requires the Department of Correction to inform both an incarcerated individual and his or her defense attorney when they are being detained solely because of bail under $10 and sets limits on how long the Department of Correction can take to make the notification. This $1 bail situation affected almost 150 people last year between September and December alone. I want to thank um, the Chair of the Criminal Justice Committee, uh, Keith Powers, and uh, his committee counsel, Alan Sivin, who spent so much time working on this legislation. Alana. Oh, I apologize. Alana Sivin. Thank you. Thanks, Roy. Uh, next is introduction 1199A, sponsored by Councilmember Keith Powers, the chair of our criminal justice uh, committee. It will require, uh, it would remove the 2% fee on credit card payments made online and the 8% fee charged on credit card payments when paying in person at correctional facilities, and it will improve access to bail payment for individuals and families of limited financial means. Uh, Keith has been amazing uh, in getting these bills through, and I want to invite him up to talk on his thank bill. Thank you. Thank you to Speaker. And uh, I want to thank all my colleagues, including uh, Councilmember Lansman, who have supported this bill, and a number of the advocacy groups who have been pushing to reduce or eliminate the fines and the fees that are, in uh, that are uh, involved in our criminal justice system. The bills that we're passing today are really built on the work that's being done in Albany to completely redo and reform the bail system here in New York State. But here in the city, we can do our own part, which is to eliminate these unnecessary fees, to give incarcerated people better notification about their situation with a $1 bail or nine, you know, not anything under $10, to ensure that people, that our system is fair to those who are being uh, detained here in the city. Uh, my bill will eliminate fees associated with paying bail by credit card or online, which can be up to 8% for uh, an individual who's paying bail. This ends up adding uh, non-refundable fees to people's bail. It adds to the price of incarceration in New York City, and I am proud that we are taking a step here to eliminate that. This comes on the heels of a uh, a bill we passed last year in 2018 that was sponsored by Speaker Johnson to eliminate fees for telephone calls in our city jails. I want to note that actually Connecticut's legislature today is voting on a similar bill, picking up the work that we did here in New York City and similarly passing a bill, we hope, that will uh, also eliminate fees for telephone uh, calls in a jail or a prison. What that shows to us is that the work we do here in New York City it reverberates to other cities, other states, and throughout the country, and a state that's just uh, adjacent to us is now picking up the work that we've done here. So as we continue to do work in this city to uh, reform our criminal justice system and starting with some of the fees and the hidden costs of incarceration, we know that other cities are going to look at us, and we hope that other, state, other cities and states will pick up the work that we're doing right here in New York City. I do think we are being leaders here in the city and the state around criminal justice reform. I think this is another step in that leadership. I want to thank Speaker Johnson for his leadership, starting with that telephone call bill last year. It's sending a signal to people and, and many of the groups that we work with who are dealing with incarcerated people that New York City is taking a real serious look at our criminal justice system and trying to change it and trying to improve people's lives. So I'm deeply grateful. I also want to thank all the staff here in the Criminal Justice Committee. I want to thank my colleagues for their support. I look forward to uh, voting on it today. I'm, I'm confident we'll be passing. I want to thank Speaker Johnson for his continued leadership around criminal justice issues and being showing other cities and states that New York City is going to start and is going to lead on these issues. So thank you thank so you. much. Thanks. Congratulations. Thank you. Well, call Ben up uh, to talk on his bill on electronic submissions of water tank inspection report. Thank you, uh, Speaker. Uh, Good to follow you again at another press conference. Uh, thank you for the great work on intro 1259. I am a council member of Ben Kalos. New York City water is the best in the world, straight from the tap, and we aim to keep it that way. I, I try to drink my eight glasses a day, so does my daughter, so does my wife, 
and it's great. It's New York City. Uh, people actually try to sell our water in other places because of how amazing it is. I want to thank city and state uh, for their great reporting on this issue. They exposed the entire issue and a lot of what we're doing. Uh, and I'm proud to be a sponsor of one bill and a co-sponsor of all the others in the package uh, that I hope will restore faith. Not that I hope that anyone lost it, but in our city's water supply. And again, I want to thank our uh, speaker, Corey Johnson, for his past and current leadership on public health, as well as our health committee chair, Mark Levine. Thank you. Thanks, Ben. Nothing safe to you. Thank you, at Ben Kalos. Yes. Um, <laughs> finally, uh, the city council will vote on a groundbreaking bill which would prohibit drug testing for marijuana as a condition as a condition for hiring in New York City. Introduction 1445, sponsored by public advocate Jumani Williams, prohibits New York City employers from requiring a prospective employee to be tested for marijuana. Marijuana is now legal in several states and cities across the country, and medical marijuana is legal in our state, and recreational marijuana, as we said before, may soon follow. New York City employers should not disqualify candidates because of their legal use of marijuana prior to their employment. Drug testing for marijuana is imprecise. False positives can occur up to a month after use and do not necessarily indicate that a person is impaired at the moment of testing. And I want to congratulate the public advocate on this really important bill. He worked on this when he was in the city council. So that is our agenda today. I'm happy to take on topic questions with my colleagues here uh, first before we go off topic. Any on? Yes, Bridget. Oh, sure. Sure, it's, I'm not going to tell you all of them just because it's a lot. There are a lot of changes. Um, we can get you the document. Uh, we are, um, uh, Councilmember Kalos is now the new chair of our contracts committee. Councilmember Brannon is moving from contracts chair to be chair of a committee that previously existed in the city council, which is the recovery and resiliency committee. Uh, there are changes on committee memberships. Um, all across the board. We eliminated the subcommittee that Council Merkelos uh, used to chair as part of the Land Use Committee. Of course, there's the action, which I'm happy to talk about during Off Topic, on Council Member uh, Yeager no longer being on the Immigration Committee. And there are a lot of other changes. None of them, I think nearly every council member, these are, uh, these are changes that 99% of the council members requested. You know, they wanted to switch committees, they didn't want to be on this committee. So it was all done in a, a cordial, collegial way, of course, with the exception of the, the change on the immigration committee. Um, so those are, those are the changes that we're seeing today. Yes. Yeah, it did. It happened, uh, I believe it happened either once or twice. Applicant. Yeah, so there were opportunities. Some of it has to do with special elections when someone leaves and you fill the seat and you have to rejigger the committees. Some of it is that people's preferences change and there's a way to accommodate them. I'm not sure that under Speaker Mark Viverito there was a creation of a new committee and an elimination of a committee, but regular membership changes happened during her tenure as Speaker. Joe? So the, um, let me just get you the information here that we have. So, I mean, we made a bunch of changes to the, the way the land use committee is going to work overall. They're very kind of granular, and I'm happy to get you exactly what they are, what exactly it does. Um, we thought that the work that the subcommittee was doing under Councilmember Kalos could be handled by the other committees that are already doing similar type of work. So. Um, we thought it was in some ways duplicative and we're grateful for the great job that Council Member Kalos did uh, during his time as subcommittee chair, but he had an interest in chairing the contracts committee. Uh, Council Member Brandon had an interest in making some changes as well, so that's really all it, all it was. Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> Council Member Consta Constantinides has been doing incredible work on climate change and you see we're contemplating introduction 1253, which the council has been working on for years and will be the most far-reaching piece of legislation in the country on combating climate change. 
Uh, but he's been handling a lot. I mean, his committee has been extraordinarily busy in what they're handling uh, on us having a Green New Deal here in New York City. We think there are some issues outside of it on resiliency specifically and on the waterfront in New York City, which uh, this committee could look at in a way that doesn't take away from the work that the chair has been doing under his committee right now. So we're just looking to find other opportunities for folks. Any other questions? Rich? Yes, there were, there were a lot. So I can. We, no, they weren't. They weren't upset by it. But I mean, some of them had asked for it. Others were okay when we made changes, because whenever you remove someone off one committee, you have to replace them, or the committee has to have a certain number of members. So maybe not all of them said, "Hey, I want to be on." I'm just making this up. The higher ed committee. But when we said, "Can you come off this committee and be on higher ed?" They didn't specifically request it themselves, but they were okay with it when they were told that that was the case. But then there were a lot of members who specifically said, I want to be on a committee. Council member Adrian Adams wanted to be on uh, uh, Chair Richards' committee on public safety. She made that request. We put her on that committee. There were other things like that. It was really sort of case by case uh, that how we went through it. No one said to me, but my chief of staff who runs the council, Jason Goldman, has been the one handling all these changes and having the one-on-one -on -one conversations with the council members. And the latest information I had about an hour ago is that there didn't seem to be anyone who was upset, uh, besides, of course, Council Member Yeager, uh, on, on the changes that were being made today. Any other questions that are on topic? Okay, off topic. Going once, going, okay. <laughs> that was a quick press conference. Bridget. Sure, what's your question? So there's no, it wasn't part of a disciplinary proceeding because disciplinary proceedings go through the Standards and Ethics Committee and this was a consensus driven decision by the members of leadership initially that this came to and there was nearly unanimous agreement amongst the leadership team here at the city council that this was the appropriate decision to make in wake of not just his comments but also there really not being any level of apology or recognition about the divisive nature of his comments and the fact that uh, the immigration committee we want to be a committee that all communities and immigrants feel welcome when they come and testify. Uh, and so um, that is uh, how this decision was made. Uh, one of the things that I found disappointing is that he hasn't acknowledged how hurtful this is. I don't even mean hurtful. I mean, this is not fun for the council members here at the council. It's not fun for us to be able to do this. Never fun when it involves a colleague. But it's more important that all communities across New York City feel seen, heard, recognized, and respected. And I feel like the comments involved a level of denigration and erasure that um, I don't think, my personal opinion is that someone who is unwilling to recognize that those comments had that effect and apologize in some way, I'm not sure there's someone that should be on that committee. When I stood up here about two weeks ago, at this uh, podium uh, less than 24 hours after the comments were made. I did not say in that moment that he should be removed from the Immigration Committee. I said he should have an opportunity to clarify his remarks and I don't think the clarification that was made was helpful. This is not about a question related to international geographic law. Uh, that is a question that many people have not been able to resolve and is complicated and painful and difficult. We see elections happening in Israel today. Um, but the question is, when you refer to people as so-called Palestinians, there is a level of what I consider to be dehumanization. And there wasn't an apology for that rhetoric, which I find very troublesome. Ivan? 
I've, I've spoken to Councilmember Yeager multiple times. He's not happy with the action that we're taking here today. And I've remained professional and collegial. I have to look out for this institution. I have to look out for the members of this institution and the image that we project to the entire city of New York and all communities that we respect and are responsive to all communities, I think is very, very important. This isn't personal. This is about us taking what we consider to be a consensus-driven, appropriate action in the wake of the comments that were made and the lack of, I consider to be, clarification and apology in the wake of those comments. Jeff? So what was the process that you were The process was I had a conversation in this room uh, with the leadership team of the city council. Nearly every member of the leadership team was present that day, and there was uh, a nearly unanimous opinion. Every council member around the table went around. There was no one that was silent. We had a long discussion about what the appropriate course of action was. Now, we were already going to make committee changes anyway that had been in the works predating these comments, but the decision was made that this was the appropriate action by the leadership team. Um, I didn't make this unilaterally. I didn't pressure council members in that room to, to, to take a certain position. It was an open dialogue, an open conversation, and I'm not saying this to pat myself on the back, but a bunch of members have said to me who have been here for previous speakers that typically actions were done unilaterally and that there wasn't a conversation at the leadership level to figure out a consensus-driven way forward. So I think that's probably the best process to use and figuring things out with this level of sensitivity and of a delicate nature. And then after the leadership team made that decision, that is when we informed the press that that was the, um, the direction that we were heading in, and then we had a longer conversation about this yesterday at Democratic Conference with uh, over 30 members in the room. And again, in that uh, meeting, there was a consensus that this was the appropriate action. No, because, the, because there was no violation of council policy. This was, this was us believing that given his comments and there not being a level of apology, recognition, wanting to heal, understanding they were divisive, that the members here didn't think that it was appropriate that he continue to be on that committee, but there was, what, uh, there was no complaint and there was no uh, what deemed to be a violation of council policy. You have a right to free speech, uh, but you're held to a higher standard and uh, you don't have a right to be on a committee. You can still say what you want, but there are repercussions for what we say. Um, so I thought that we gave the council member the opportunity to try to heal the division that was caused by his comments, and I hadn't seen an effort to actually do that. Uh, uh, anyone? Rich? Oh, I think this committee has been instrumental. This committee is a committee that was a driving force behind the municipal ID that happened under Speaker Mark Viverito and uh, Mayor de Blasio's first term as mayor. This committee has been a committee that has taken a look at the cruel and inhumane childhood separation policies that have happened at the border when many of those children were brought here to New York City in the dark of night and we had hearings about that with the service providers. This is a committee that has looked at uh, ensuring legal representation for uh, detained New Yorkers by ICE. This is a committee that is deeply important because almost 40% of New Yorkers who are currently living in New York City, I think the number is 38% to be precise, were not born in the United States of America. So this is a very important committee. It's a committee that's done a huge amount of important work, not just during the last 16 months while I've been speaker, but in all the years that it's been in creation. Uh, Councilmember Chaka has been a very passionate chair of this committee, and he was preceded by Councilmember Drum, who represents, I believe, the most diverse district in the city of New York, centered in Jackson Heights. So this is a very, very important committee. Uh, Ivan? Was there any consideration about mandatories as No. Joe? I 
think I've, I think I've talked about it. I mean, this is a case-by-case -case situation. <clears throat> That's how we handle these matters. There was a consensus in leadership and amongst the wider body that this was the appropriate action to take. These are hard, difficult, not easy choices, but it involves a colleague who you know and interact with on a daily basis. Um, and council members have to make their own decision that they think is appropriate, but uh, I think this is the appropriate course and action to take. Uh, Bridget? Well, I'm glad that the health department uh, and the mayor declared a state of emergency because this is an emergency and we need, the message needs to go out that um, we need people to get vaccinated. We need children to be vaccinated. They're, the people who currently have measles are not just the ones who are at risk, but you know, you can spread measles in an airborne related way just by being close to someone. So you're basically endangering uh, a lot of other people around you. So I think the decision today on how it relates to uh, religious schools, on how it relates to ensuring that they bring people into greater compliance on this is uh, fundamental and important. This is a health emergency. We saw what's been happening in Rockland County. Now we see what's happening in Brooklyn. The vast majority of the cases, of course, have centered in Williamsburg and traditionally orthodox uh, neighborhoods. A few cases in Crown Heights, a few in Bensonhurst, a few in uh, Borough Park, but predominantly uh, in Williamsburg. I think the what the health department thinks at this point is possibly the reason why we're seeing the higher numbers now is because uh, folks in the Jewish community gather together during Purim, which just happened, and that's potentially how you saw more people become infected. And with Passover coming up, when more people are gonna congregate together as families and to celebrate this really important holiday for the Jewish community, it's really important we try to get this under control before those gatherings happen, which could potentially uh, infect more people. So I'm really concerned. This is a health emergency. Uh, Chair Levine left, but he has been talking about this for a while. And and I really want to thank the reporting of, I apologize if I get her name wrong, but Gwen, uh, who has been all over this for weeks on end, not just in Brooklyn, but also uh, up in Rockland County. She was on New York One uh, last week talking about this. She's been tweeting about it every day, writing about it every day, long before the press conference today. And the reporting on this, I think, has been instrumental and key. The mayor's been talking about this before today. So the mayor, I believe, talked about this, I think, um, with either Errol or Brian in his weekly segments. I believe, I could be wrong on that, but I feel like I remember him talking about this. I know that the health commissioner, Dr. Barbeau, has been talking about it as well. Um, I'm not a public health expert. Um, I did chair the health committee before when we went through both Legionnaires and Ebola. Uh, in the previous term of the council, and these things are tricky and important. I mean, maybe it should have been declared earlier, but I'm not in the position, I don't have the uh, epidemiological expertise and background to tell you what day it should have been declared, but I do think that Dr. Barbeau is an excellent health commissioner, and we have the best department of health in the country, and they've done a great job in the past when there have been public health crises, but the most important thing now, I think, is just to ensure that as many people as possible are vaccinated and that we contain this and get people the vaccination that they need. Anyone else? Uh, Summer and then Joe? Uh, so the council has a budget council meeting. Come, yes, it comes out today and I can happy to give you 
um, some highlights. So we're releasing it later this afternoon. We reviewed 200 expense, capital, and revenue proposals. It's going to be very, very detailed. I can give you a few highlights of what it's going to contain. The council is going to call for uh, an additional $250 million to be set aside as part of our reserves. Last year, the council was able to achieve $225 million. The administration, when we were asked them at our hearings if they wanted more reserves, they did not indicate that that was important. We think it is important. We identified over the current fiscal year we're in, fiscal year 2019, and the next fiscal year, fiscal year 2020, the council itself, separate from what OMB has presented and separate from their PEG program of $750 million, we identified a billion dollars in potential savings over the uh, current fiscal year and the next fiscal year. We asked for an investment of $40 million for census funding. The state provided $20 million to go to community-based organizations. We're asking for $200 million to increase fair student funding. Last year in the executive budget, the mayor came back from our preliminary budget response and included $125 million. Last year we called on $250 million, and he came back with half of that. And there's a lot of other stuff. We're calling for the doubling of compass slots uh, for young people to go from 47,000 to 100,000 uh, slots. We're asking to increase the amount of money for NIFIP, the legal service providers providing uh, attorneys for folks that are currently detained by six and a half million to go from 10 million to 16 and a half million. Uh, and we're calling uh, for a big one. We're calling for $106 million to be added to the human service contracts so that they can go from 10% to 12% to cover more of their costs. We're asking for $89 million to be added to the, day, to, to the daycare council, which negotiates the budget with child care workers in New York City. There are huge pay disparities that exist. These are predominantly women of color that are doing this work. And we also call for some greater pay parity for people that are working in district attorney's offices as well as defense providers that are doing indigent legal defense work. Those are some of the highlights, though it's a lot more granular. We go agency by agency on new proposals, on uh, revenue proposals, on the capital budget, and the list goes on. Yes? Not yet, but we are open to that because what's happening right now is uh, $106 million was put in the preliminary budget for fair fares. In the last, uh, I don't know if I'm supposed to say this, Jen, but uh, in the last uh, week, uh, about 8,000 people have signed up for fair fares in one week's time. And that's because they switched from needing to go in person to HRA to collect it to being able to get it online. So that just went into effect. So a lot more people are signing up. The single swipe is now in effect, not just the weekly and the monthly. And we're expanding populations. Initially, it was a smaller population of folks who were on uh, cash assistance and food stamps that were already in the HRA system. We're going up to additional folks that are with HRA. And then we're moving towards additional populations that are going to be covered with uh, uh, this year. So it's a ramping up process. So after the executive budget hearings happen uh, in May, at the end of that, we're going to see where we are on the uh, uptake rate on fair fares, which will give us a target. Or are we going to spend the $106 million that was budgeted last year and this year? Do we need additional money? At this point, I think 106 is a good placeholder. If we need additional money, seeing on how many people sign up, that's a good thing. Just to provide a little bit of context, which is very, very important. The other major city in America that has instituted a fair fares program is the city of Seattle. The city of Seattle, I believe in their first year, only had 2% of eligible people sign up. So we are uh, actually at this very early stage doing a lot better, I think, than they're doing on the trajectory that we're on. Part of that is we just started an advertising campaign. So they started an online advertising campaign uh, digitally targeting people who live in neighborhoods that have higher rates of poverty that would qualify for fair fares. Yo off. I don't have the exact number, but it's ramping up quite a bit. Literally in a week, 8,000 people. Okay. And last year, you, you made fair fares kind of the, the centerpiece of, of your ask uh, for the mayor um, as far as the response. Do you have an issue like that that, that is going to be something you, you really won't budge on? Yes. So there are a few issues. Number one is the reserves. It's really, really important for the financial future of the city of New York that if and when a downturn comes, and a downturn will come, 
that we are padded in a way where there won't be deep cuts for social services and programs that are really important. So I think the reserves, not sexy, not headline grabbing, not super exciting, but very important for the long-term financial health of the city. Number two, we wanna invest in, strengthen, and protect our social safety net. Our social safety net is emergency food, it's the Human Services Council that I talked about and giving them an increase, and it is all the other programs, Compass and uh, programs at the Administration for Children's Services. We include a proposal in here for Fair Futures, which will help foster kids in the system that the advocates put together. So there's a series of proposals that strengthen and protect the social safety net in New York City. And then the last thing is we have a running theme, <coughs> excuse me, we have a running theme of uh, pay parity. So we haven't seen pay parity amongst workers in New York City, especially municipal workers. So that's why we're calling on the $89 million for the child care workers, uh, many of whom are part of uh, uh, Local 1707, which is part of DC 37. <clears throat> we're calling for pay parity again for DAs and for indigent defense providers. And we talk about how we need greater pay parity among some of the uh, labor contracts that are done, but those have to be part of contract negotiations. These are separate because the child care workers, the, uh, the DAs, and the indigent uh, defense providers are not part of a municipal contract negotiation with the city. So we give an exact dollar figure for those ones, but for ones that include a direct negotiation between municipal unions and the administration, we don't give a dollar figure, but we talk about having pay parity for the employees that need it. You see a huge pay differential amongst women, specifically women of color in New York City. Uh, we had a, an equal pay rally last week on the steps of City Hall with CWA Local 1180. Uh, they had a lawsuit that they just recently settled on this regarding pay parity, and so we call on that in the budget. Those are some of the themes that exist in our budget response. I have to end soon, but we'll keep going. We'll go Jeff, and then Joe, and then Summer. Sure. We didn't take uh, an action based on what Councilmember Diaz Sr. said based off of a standards and ethics investigation. It was a decision that was made by the body through the Rules Committee, just like we're doing here today, to dissolve a committee in wake of those comments. So it's, it's, it's the same thing. Though, you know, doesn't mean that other things may not come up. I can't talk about current investigations, but, you know, um, but the mechanism that we used in that moment a couple of months ago was the same mechanism that we're using today, which was not through a recommendation or a disciplinary proceeding based off standards and ethics. It was done through a decision made by the membership of the council to do something through the Rules Committee. Uh, Summer and then Joe. Uh, and the then Katie. Question, um, okay. I was, uh, yeah, I supported it before. I support the bill. I think Councilmember Kalos has been one of the leading voices on campaign finance reform here in the city council. Uh, when he chaired the Government Operations Committee, and he's done that even while he's not been chair of that committee. And you just saw the voters overwhelmingly up the public match through the Charter Revision Commission question that went on the ballot from 55% to 75%. If we wanted <clears throat> a true public matching system, the way to do it is through the bill that Councilmember Kalos has had for years now, which is to get up to 88, 89% of the bill. So I'm proud of Councilmember Kalos and his leadership on this, and I support this bill. Joe? Yes. I don't know if we have enough time for me to answer this question. <laughs> what I mean by that is it's very, very complicated, but I do support a 15% set aside. I think we are in a homelessness crisis. I think that we need to target the units of housing that were created to help homeless individuals and families. 
I think we have to put more money into supportive housing, which this budget response, I didn't mention it before, but the budget response includes us calling for additional money for supportive housing. I know that there is a, a difference of opinion at this point on whether or not it should be achieved through direct legislation or through HBD putting this in their term sheets that they put out with individual respondents and developers project by project. I think that uh, incoming Deputy Mayor Bean has showed a greater willingness to look at this issue, and she was someone who was good to work with when she was HPD commissioner on these issues. I worked with her locally on things like this, so I look forward to having that conversation with her, but I support um, Councilmember Salamanca's bill, and I think he's been a tremendous leader on this, and I'm really, really grateful to the advocates. I met <clears throat> about two weeks ago with the coalition that has been pushing this. I met with Ms. Flowers, who's the woman that uh, showed up to talk to the mayor at the YMCA, and she's uh, over 70 years old and homeless and has been in a shelter for more than two years. And to hear the personal toll that has taken on her and other people like her is extraordinarily moving and important and shows that we have to move swiftly on this. So I support Councilmember Salamanca's bill we are continuing to have conversations through our legislative division with the administration on the right way to achieve it. Anyone else? Calling once, going, thank you very much, bye.